Acts chapter 13, and we'll read verse 48. Now, we're going to be covering several passages. Uh, we're going to be doing some apologetics today. So, we're going to be covering some apologetics. And uh, some of you people don't like it when I talk about this subject again, because these people, they can be one of the most annoying people to uh, argue the Bible with. Let's talk about our Calvinist friends, shall we? <laughs> Acts chapter 13 and verse 48. So, there are three groups of people, like I mentioned before, who are the most problematic when you debate Bible. They are Calvinist, Seventh-day Adventist, and then uh, Jehovah Witnesses. The reason why is because out of all the other churches, these are groups who will actually have Bible studies. Now, the problem with some of them, like a few Calvinists, for example, they just set, stay in the, locked up in their bedrooms for so long just studying the Bible, they don't think about having an active life dealing with people. Some of them also, they just want to live a life of debating, 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 rather than witnessing to people, which is very important. So the Calvinists, I'll be covering some of their arguments here. So we're going to look at Acts chapter 13 and verse 48, please. So what we're going to do now is cover some of the terms that Calvinism will use. So we're going to use some of the verses that Calvinists will use, and then we're going to see in weight and evidence of the Scripture how much it will hold. So then what we believe in is free will. That's what we believe in. We believe that every person has the choice and the responsibility for the actions and the consequences. We don't just use God as a cop-out. So then we just blame everything on God. So that, that is nonsense. You can't say that God chose specific people to get saved and specific people to burn in hell. That is a sadistic, that is a mean, that is a messed up God. Everyone has the freedom of choice if they want to get saved or they want to remain lost. So we're going to look at several verses they might use. Acts 13, verse 48. Notice that in their text, it seems to show, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. So notice right here that in Acts chapter 13 and verse 48, that's the first text they will use. Now, this is one of the famous texts they will use that you want to keep in mind. So I'll put a star next to this one, the ones that are considered pretty famous, okay? So Acts chapter 13, verse 48, you'll notice right here, these people were already ordained to eternal life. God ordained them to get saved. That's why they believed. So that's how the Calvinists will argue. Before they believed in Jesus, God already specifically ordained these people. But the problem is this. You'll notice right here that it's not a selected number of individuals. You'll notice that it's not like he got saved, she got saved, he got ordained, she got ordained, and God was picking and choosing which individual. You'll notice it's a group of people. It's Gentiles. What they neglect to see is verse 46 through 47. Now look at this. They jumped to 48, but they did not read the two verses behind it. Two verses behind it. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. Because they're speaking to the Jews. Because remember, the Jews were hearing the word of God first, but then they were rejecting it. Ah, so isn't this interesting? Out of their free choice, they rejected it. Now look at this. But seeing he put it from you, see their free choice, they put it away. And judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the who. That's why God said, okay, then I'm going to head toward this group of people. I'm going to ordain them. That's what he did. That's why it makes sense, like, if you ever uh, done witnessing to a group of people or to a city, Jesus Christ even said, if this city doesn't listen to you, and that was their free choice too. It was an ordination. It wasn't God electing them. Out of their free choice, and God said, I'm going to send you. I'm going to select. I'm going to go send you toward a different area where you can witness to them. And guess what? When you witness to that group of people, not all of them were ordained or chosen to get saved. Every one of them had a free choice to reject or to accept it. 
Now let's keep reading. Uh, verse 47, so we see right here in 46, they turn to the Gentiles. 47, for so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. So they neglect to see the context that God, he ordained the Jews first to get saved, then the Gentiles afterward. That's how the gospel pattern worked. What God was doing was, I'm going to send you to Jews and then send you to Gentiles, that kind of pattern. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans 1, 16, and Acts chapter 1, and verse 8. you got to understand this. In these passages, what they overlook, so then in this case, this other side, they neglected verses 46 through 47. And then when you compare that, you see this pattern that matches with Acts chapter 1, verse 8, as well as Romans chapter 1, verse 16. What you're going to notice right here is that it's not God picking and choosing who gets saved, who gets lost. He wants everyone... He wants everyone to get saved. But the pattern was, when we do this gospel presentation, we're going to start with the Jews, and then we're going to go toward the Gentiles. That's what he was simply showing. That's why Acts 13, 48, it shows that's why the Gentiles were ordained to eternal life. So let's look at Acts chapter 1, and then we will read verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, look at this, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, see Jews. But then Samaria, that's partially Jew and partially Gentile. And unto the uttermost part of the earth, there is your Gentile. And by the way, since it says uttermost part of the earth, that shows it's everybody. That's what God's doing. He's giving the gospel to everybody, not picking and choosing who gets the gospel, who doesn't. So let's also look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. What are you going to do with this one? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Do you believe God is powerful? Amen. All right, so he's powerful enough unto salvation to who? Everyone that believeth. See that? So God is powerful enough to save everybody. So then you can make God lose his electing power, I guess, by limiting it to a certain amount of people if you want to do it that way. But here's the thing. God's power of salvation reaches to everybody that believeth. But look at this, this pattern, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So that's what Paul was simply pointing out right here. What Paul was simply pointing out right here is that, yeah, the Gentiles were ordained to eternal life. Why? Because Acts 1.8, Romans 1.16 showed that this gospel... After they go to the Jews, it's going to go to the Gentiles. And that means everybody. Okay, let's look at John chapter 15, verse 16. John chapter 15 and verse 16. John chapter 15. And then we'll read verse 16. Here's their second passage that they will use. It seems to show right here that Jesus Christ already ordained them to bring forth fruit for him. God already chose them to be his elect. Look at John chapter 15, verse 16. You'll notice right here, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Ooh, see, you didn't choose Jesus Christ. You didn't have a free choice. Jesus Christ was the one that chose you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So notice right here that these people bring forth fruit. Fruit. Now, the thing is this, though. The simple error to this is that this is not God ordaining them to get saved. He's ordaining them to work for him. Because look at right here, that ye should go and bring forth fruit. See that? So that is God's, God's job. His job is to make sure that you are going to bring forth fruit for his glory. What you got to realize is this, is that you probably didn't realize this, folks. You ready for this? You probably didn't realize that your body is not your own. It's not your body. It's the temple of the Holy Ghost. It's God's. So you got to realize this. When you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
You have no other master to live for but the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. See, you got no choice. What, you're serious? Yeah, that's right. Well, then, that means I, church is not an option. That's right, church is not an option. Soul winning is not an option. That's right, soul winning is not an option. Reading the Bible, praying, cleaning up the sin is not an option. Well, no, of course not. That's why God says you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. You have no choice to live for yourself. You're supposed to bring forth fruit to God. And this is apparent when you look at Hebrews 12. Go to Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And then verse 9 through 10. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17. So notice right here that they ignore what the verse says. It's bring forth fruit. That's what they overlook. So when I get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, I can do whatever I want and live my life in sin. Oh, I don't think God takes it that way. Okay, so look at right here, Hebrews chapter 12. And then you'll notice at verse 9, it says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in who? Subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. That's why verse 11, it brings forth fruit. Now no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. See that? God, he wants you to bring forth fruit, so he's going to make you one way or another. That's why he'll punish you. He'll chastise you because you belong to him. You're his son now. Okay, let's also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Notice a verse... I'm going to turn over there and immediately read it. But notice, if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. See that? So you'll notice right here that you belong to God. So here's the idea. When you get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, that is your freedom, that is your choice. But what happens is this. Once you choose to be a child of God, God cannot undo your salvation. You're eternally secured. And God has to treat you like you're his son because you're automatically his son. So because he's your father, he has to chastise you, make you bring forth proper fruit for him. Okay, let's also look at Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Here's another supposed proof text for Calvinism. We're going to look at Jeremiah 1 and then your second hand to go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We're going to go to Jeremiah 1 and then we're going to turn to Luke chapter 1. So another verse that Calvinists will use is Luke chapter 1 and Jeremiah chapter 1. This seems to show that before birth, Jeremiah and John the Baptist, they were ordained and elected by God before birth. So it seems like long before that they were born, God already ordained them to be saved. So that seems to be a problem right there. So it seems to show that God picks and chooses who gets saved even before you were born. So you had no free choice to begin with. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, it reads, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Well, that's a problem. Luke chapter 1, verse 15. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. So notice that he already gets filled with the Holy Ghost before he was even born. While he was in the womb, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. So see, John the Baptist was saved. He had no free choice in the matter. Now, here's the key with Calvinists. I hope that you see a pattern right here. The pattern is this. 
The pattern how you catch them is that you don't see saved anywhere out of all the verses that we saw. The only one probably was Acts 13, verse 48. But in all the other verses so far, you'll notice that saved is not mentioned over there. And that's how you catch them. So when God ordains or elects something, you've got to realize this. This is for a different task, different purpose. This is not concerning about salvation. We believe this. We believe that every man has a free choice to get saved or to reject Jesus Christ and burn in hell. But we also cannot deny that when God decides to use a specific task for his glory, he's going to use whatever choice you make, whether, whether you get saved or whether you get lost, whatever free choice you make on that, God's not going to put his glory to waste. And he's going to use it for his glory. So that's what you got to keep in mind when you debate with the Calvinist. But let's get back over here. So again, this is nothing to do with salvation right here. One must realize that people can be ordained by God, Jeremiah chapter 1. People can be filled with the Spirit and preach His Word. They can do that. If God ordained them to, they can do that while having the free choice to rebel so that, and remaining a lost sinner. Let me show you some examples. Um, I'm not going to turn to this passage for a time's sake, but let me just mention this one passage. Judges 13 through 16. Before Samson was born, didn't the Bible say that God said, I'm going to use him to be a judge over my people? Now, Samson, look at his life. You think he was a good judge for the people? No. He lived his life in fornication, sleeping with many different people. And Samson just constantly rebelled against God, not listening to him. But you know what God said? I don't care what free choice you make. I'm still going to use you to be a judge for my people, for my glory. And God did that. God used Samson's rebellion, selfishness out of his own free will. God used that where he can use that to make him a judge over the Israelites. So Samson, his enemies, was still the Philistines at the end, despite of his selfishness and his rebellious attitude. And then his conflict with the Philistines was how the Lord used Samson as a judge over his people. How about that? So here's another one. Another one is Caiaphas. Caiaphas. That's found at John chapter 11 and verse 49. You can turn over there. John chapter 11 and then verse 49 through 52. 49 through 52. And then your other hand to go to, well, we won't turn all of these verses for time's sake, but then here's the other passage is Numbers 23. Numbers 23 Verse 38, all the way to chapter 24 and verse 25. And then you just can compare that with 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Man, you're going through a lot of verses, Pastor. Yeah, that's right. See, that's why we know that we're in the truth. Because what we're going to do is that we're going to look at all the evidences. So if the Calvinist wants to debate Scripture with us, because that's their evidence then we're going to use the immensity of evidence of Scripture to debunk back. Amen. That's the reason why we believe in being a Bible-believing church. You understand this, where I came from, it's so, there are so many different uh, religions, beliefs, and doctrines, and then higher education can insert that within you. But then why is it that I'm able to still remain a pastor here and become the person that I am? The reason why is this is because I had the mindset of, I want the truth, and I studied for it. When you have that mindset to begin with, that's why you remain a Christian. But if you don't have a care about that at all, then what happens is this. You're going to go with the flow with what you learn from somebody else, what you're indoctrinated by somebody else. That's why schools can indoctrinate the students to follow their pattern. But that's the same thing. Listen up now. That's the same thing with churches, too. See that? And then if a pastor messes up in something, you know what happens to the church member? They don't believe in God anymore. They become bitter and mad and they leave. Because see, they got indoctrinated more by the environment rather than they themselves independently studying. See, I can't force you to believe, folks. You, can, you only can make the decision yourselves. And God will give you the truth if you truly have the heart to do it. And if a person has a heart for truth, you know what's going to happen? You don't care what sacrifices you make, what costs you have to pay if you want the truth that bad. You know why people don't get the truth? Too much of a high cost. 
Okay, so let's look at some passages right here, okay? We're going to look at all these verses. So, uh, but I wrote them out in case we don't have time to turn over them, okay? So let's first start off with John chapter 11, verse 49. Caiaphas, was he a saved person? No, he's a lost sinner who crucified Jesus. He was responsible for accusing Jesus of blasphemy, making him guilty and crucifying him. But God used him to prophesy his word. How about that? Just like Jeremiah was ordained to preach God's word. Doesn't mean that God picked and chose if they would be saved or lost. All right, look at this verse right here. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. Now consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied <laughs> that Jesus should die for that nation. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Now, isn't that amazing? He prophesied salvation right there. And he was a law sinner. All right, let's look at Numbers chapter, uh, 2 Peter 2. All right, 2 Peter 2. But if you look at Numbers chapter 23, you'll find out that Balaam was preaching so many verses, like nearly two chapters long. Balaam was speaking the word of the Lord. He was preaching the word of the Lord. But he's not a saved person. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. We'll read verse 15. Which have forsaken the right way. See, their free choice they reject the right way and are gone astray. Following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Wow, look at that. See, he forsook the right way, went the wrong way, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Look at this. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. See that? They're lost. So you'll notice right here that in this case, these three cases right here, we see that when God ordains someone, it has nothing to do with salvation. And if it has something to do with salvation, you got to realize this. Every individual, it wasn't toward an individual who had a free choice. Every individual has a free choice to get saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you need to key on the Calvinist. You got to key on the Calvinist concerning individuals, and you got to find out if salvation is in the context. 